play. So that's one of the religious wars. All right. France had to give up territory. They had to give up territory in Europe that they had to con uh, they had accomplished, uh, conquered in earlier wars uh, under Louis XIV. Uh, treaties, greatest. Uh, Britain being a lot of uh, the former colonies that came out of him. There's. What about the treaty uh, that ended the Seven Years' War? Uh, crap. What? what was the Seven Years' War? The war between, the war between England, England and France. France. Yeah, it was, it was, it was in the United States, it's called the, the French, French and War. <laughs> it was in Europe, it was the... Seven Years. It was the Seven, it was seven Years' War, and it, it uh, mushroomed out of what conflict? The Thirty Years' War? No, no, no. What did this war mushroom out from? The Austrian what? Succession War. Say it again? The Austrian Succession the War. The War of the Austrian Succession. The War of Austrian Succession took place in... Spain. Austria. <laughs> Austria. <laughs> what? The War of the Austrian Succession uh, broke out in, like, 1640, when what prince came to the crown of Prussia? Fred Craig. And he is challenging who's right to govern. Maria Austria. Teresa. Maria yeah. Teresa. What was the name of the document that allowed Maria uh, Teresa? Uh, Pragmatic Sanction. 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 Pragmatic Sanction.
Russia was going to get uh, Poland, Prussia was going to get Saxony. And they were all good with that, but how did Austria feel about it? They felt they would obviously upset the balance of power towards Russia and Prussia, which are sandwiched around Austria. So you have Great Britain and Austria protesting this. You got two, Russia, Prussia, and two, Austria, Great Britain. Who is going to come in to help kind of... Yeah, now France, even though France was a defeated nation in all this, France is going to play a critical role in helping to get this issue settled. Eventually they cooperated. They each got a little bit less than they wanted. Russia got a little bit of Poland. Russia got a little bit of Saxony. And they maintained stability and order and a concert of Europe. It was a lasting agreement, a lasting concert of Europe or cooperation amongst them. And that's one of the things that you might see on the AP exam where they're going to compare. Compare the conference after the defeat of Napoleon with, you know, the settlement that was reached at the conclusion of World War I. Was there a lasting peace after World War I with the Treaty of Versailles? No. No, no you can see that things really weren't settled. Germany wasn't happy, you know, all the issues that came up, and then we lead into World War II. Where if you look at what happened after the Congress of Vienna, it really did create an atmosphere where you had peace for a very long period of time between these European powers. So the Congress of Vienna, okay? British retained possessions, made significant gains in India, Holland, Belgium, United, uh, united into the Netherlands uh, uh, to form a barrier against France. Prussia makes, uh, takes the left side of the Rhine, stop France again. They were trying to check France's power. And so they solidified these surrounding territories around them. All right? It's showing you the different uh, the areas of uh, Silesia and the uh, areas of Poland that were gained. Uh, Alright, what was the name of the treaty that got Russia out of World War I? Uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litov. Uh, 1918. The Treaty of brest litovsk is going to get Russia out of war. Who is the guy in Russia that wants to have this treaty? Stalin. Lenin. 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 If you wanted to fight it, then the Civil War. Lenin is, is battling right now as the Bolshevik leader trying to establish an ideal communist government in Russia. Lenin sees that this war and the conflict with Russia getting in is not helping. He wants to get Russia out of the war, so he's going to sign this treaty with Germany in 1918. And the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Russia is going to give up a lot of land on their western side, much of their industry and much of their population to Germany. But it was all because Lenin wanted to try to focus on winning this civil war. Okay, Lenin continued to fight the civil war. He used something called war communism, where he confiscated anything that was necessary for the Red Army to defeat the whites, nationalized land, did all these things to try to win that civil war, and eventually they will. Uh, Lenin felt his communist experiment was failing at the early stages of the, of, of the Soviet Union, and he felt you know the Bolshevik Party, which is now the Communist Party, might fail, and so what drastic economic measure did he take? The NEP. And we say the NEP was a drastic measure from Lenin because what did it? It, it introduced, introduced capitalist ideas. It did. It introduced elements of capitalism. It allowed for farmers, peasant farmers, to sell excess surplus grains, keep the profit. It allowed for small businesses to exist, and for those small businesses to, you know, in a, in a a capitalistic free market society sell their goods for what they would want and, and gain whatever kind of profit they could. That, according to Lenin, was like taking one step backwards and take two steps forward. Was there a group that benefited from that? What were the prosperous farmers called? Kolaks. And so when Stalin came in, and when Stalin, who despised capitalism, when Stalin came into power, and he wanted to remove the NEP and begin his five-year plans. One of the things that he did is he nationalized the land, 
collectivized the land and brought it back under government control, state control. How did the Kulaks respond? They revolted. They rebelled by burning their crops and destroying their livestock. And Stalin responded by, yeah, isolating all their farms, starving them to death, many of them were simply killed. And that's a great example of the ruthlessness of Stalin and the contrast between he and Lenin's ideas. Okay? All right. Uh, Lenin promises to give peace, land, and bread. This is when he comes and makes his speech. You had a provisional government that was in power at the time who had taken over when the Tsar abdicated. The Tsar and his family will eventually be killed as the Bolsheviks take over, the provisional government take over, uh, you know, uh, as best they can, the running of the government, still at, at war, in the civil war with the whites. This will consolidate uh, the Bolshevik power. Russia is going to give up territories in Poland they had gained earlier, the Ukraine, Finland, and the Baltic provinces. Lenin believed that Germany would eventually be defeated and they would get back some of the land. Okay, with the peace agreement, Germany sends its soldiers to the Western Front and continues fighting, so they no longer had to fight a two-front war. So what eventually gave the, uh, the advantage then to the Allies, if, if now Germany only has to fight on one war? America. Yeah, the United States issued the war to push, uh, give them a great uh, boost to the uh, Allies. These are the territories that was lost under the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. See, that's a pretty large chunk of land. Poland, Finland. All right, what was the famous treaty uh, after the war? If I think of uh, if I think of World War One and the peace treaty that ended World War One. I need to think of the big four. Can you, does anybody know who the big four were? Oh, Somebody great. raise your hand so I can see uh, where we're at. Go. Uh, England, yeah. France, United States, Russia. No, Russia was out of no. England, France, America, and Italy. Okay. Who represented the United States? Woodrow Wilson, president. Who represented Italy? Uh, Victoria Orlando. Who represented Great Britain? David Lloyd George. Who represented France? Clemenceau. George's Clemenceau. All right, now. Why? Yes, we did learn it. That was a long time ago. Go back and dig out your uh, chapter 27 term sheet. All right. Now, listen up. What's this, why is this important? It's important because you need to know what was going on at the Paris Peace Conferences to get this issue settled. What we need to understand is this. Why did Italy, who had been on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary, why did they eventually join on the Allied side during the war? They wanted land. They wanted land from Austria. Were they going to get that land? No. Nope. No, and so Victoria Orlando is going to be upset by this, and he's going to leave the meetings. Woodrow Wilson. President of the United States, what was his peace plan called? The 14, 14 points. points. The 14 points was a peace agreement that really did not have any victors. He saw it as basically trying to settle the issue of a conflict without bringing about too much punishment upon any one nation. Is that the way France saw it? No. Is that the way Great Britain saw it? No. Particularly France. What was the biggest concern that France had in the treaty? That uh, Germany would not get power again. To their big them. concern was their security. They wanted to make sure that Germany would not be a threat to them in the future. And so France was definitely concerned with providing revenge against Germany. Initially, so was Great Britain. Great Britain was more in support with France in trying to weaken Germany. And we'll see the Treaty of Versailles is going to become very harsh upon Germany because Woodrow Wilson, in his 14 points, is not going to get everything he wanted. There are two key things, though, that we need to know about Woodrow Wilson's 14 points that will become part of the Treaty of Versailles. What's one of them? League, League of Nations. Nations. The creation of the League of Nations. Why did Woodrow Wilson want to create a League of Nations? He felt that a league, of, an international organization, of all the different nations in the world being represented in this union of nations could help create a peaceful diplomatic solution to going to war. And so if there was two nations that had a conflict, 
instead of having to get to the point where, for example, having uh, Serbia being uh, forced to accept an ultimatum or not accept an ultimatum and face war, instead of being faced with a situation like that between Austria and Serbia, this international organization get together, diplomatically work it out with the other nations helping to mediate to bring back, to bring about a... Uh, to bring about a um, peace, peaceful settlement to avoid war, diplomatic settlement. So what do Wilson want to League of Nations? What's the other thing you want? National self-determination. National self-determination. What was one of the big hotbeds of World War I? Why was it caused? Well, we think about all these different long-term causes. You think about imperial uh, rivalries, imperial tension. You think about militarism. You think about uh, the alliance system. You think about um, the nationalism that was creating tension amongst these nations. You had nationalism in the areas where minority groups were desiring to have their own independent nation states, particularly in that region of the Balkans where the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand took place. Nationalism, the idea that you have an opportunity as a nation, as an ethnic group, as a nationality, to create your own nation state by who you are. Your desire to create your own national identity, self-determination. National self-determination was another big element of Woodrow Wilson. Those two got into the League, uh, or the, uh, the League of Nations and the uh, National Self-Determination were part of the peace settlement. But Woodrow Wilson, not able to get the others to agree to kind of have a peace without revenge, a more just peace, left the meetings and went back to the United States. Who did it leave the final terms of the Treaty of Versailles up to? France, France and Great Britain. Britain. France and Great Britain, the two countries that had the most to gain by punishing Germany. And thus, Germany had a very harsh treaty placed upon them. Uh, besides losing territory, besides getting back Alsace Lorraine, what other other issues that Germany had to accept? The Rhine. Uh, they were forced to blame. The blame, yeah. Article 231 was the, the article in the treaty that basically Germany had to accept they caused the war. Why was that so critical? Germany felt that it didn't start the war, and it also opened them up to have to pay war reparations. That they would have to pay war damages that had taken place during the war. That was huge because that dollar figure was not set at the meeting, but later was set at some $32 billion that they would have to pay. Huge, huge numbers. And so that obviously contributed to the post-World War I German recovery. Obviously, all of Europe was devastated by the war and had to try to rebuild. Had to rebuild factories and had to rebuild uh, their economies. So that's huge. By the way, did the United States participate in the League of Nations? No. no. It was not. The president can negotiate a peace treaty, but who must ratify or Congress. approve it? The Congress. Congress. Separation of powers. So uh, here's what the Treaty of Versailles did. Uh, why did Russia get all these territories? Why didn't the Soviet Union get those territories? Because they withdrew the rest of the country. They had signed a separate treaty. They had signed a separate treaty. They were involved in the peace conference. And based on national self-determination, why would you turn these territories over to the Soviet Union? We're different. Okay? So we see new nations created. We see all these new nations created, including Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. And you see all the way up and down here, we have these new nations along the border where Germany was. Another big issue, when they created Poland, it was kind of landlocked. It didn't have access to the sea. And so to humiliate the Germans even more, they carved out a chunk of Germany called the Polish Corridor and created a free trade city of Danzig. And it separated Germany into this area of East Prussia and the rest of Germany. So again, this was something else that the German people despised. Okay? Uh, Alsace Lorraine. This was a territory that Otto von Bismarck took at the conclusion of the Franco-Prussian War, which helped to unite Germany into those three different wars, the war with Denmark, the Seven Weeks War, Austro-Prussian War, and then the Franco-Prussian War, which helped to unify Germany under Bismarck. When Bismarck ended the war, Seven Weeks War with Austria, he treated Austria very kindly, in a sense. He only wanted them isolated from German affairs, otherwise there was no land exchange, there was no you know reparations or anything like that. He just wanted Austria out because he knew he might need Austria in the future as an ally. When Bismarck defeated France, 
during the Franco-Prussian War, did he treat French the same way? No. They signed the treaty in the Hall of Mirrors, right? A humiliating thing in the Palace of Versailles for the French to accept this defeat and sign it in their own Palace of Versailles, right? They also had to lose, besides a large sum of money, this territory of Alsace-Lorraine to Germany. So at the conclusion of the Paris Peace Conference, when they signed the Treaty of Versailles, where was it signed? It was signed in the Hall of Mirrors, and obviously France got back their territory that they had lost to Germany before. Okay. Questions? Can you name the peace talks that were held at the end of World War II? The European oh, campaign. Was... Yalta, Iran, those were all during the war. What was the one that took place after the war? Potsdam. After the war in Europe, we ended. Potsdam. 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 Okay. Potsdam, July 1945. Do you remember who the big three were? Russia, Russia uh, America. America. Soviet Union. America. All right, so the Soviet Union, Stalin, Great Britain, Winston Churchill. Churchill. The United States, Roosevelt. Now, but by Potsdam, what had happened? He died. He died. So Roosevelt had died. Who's going to replace him at Potsdam? Truman. 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 Okay. During the course of the meetings of Potsdam, the elections are held in Great Britain, and the Prime Minister Churchill, his party will lose, and he'll be replaced by Clement Attlee. And so the only of the original Big Three would be Stalin. It is at these peace conferences where what major issue comes to play? Uh, the territory that they gave us. Like Eastern, oh, Eastern uh, the Truman Doctrine. <laughs> Friendly governments versus? Unfriendly. No. Free elections. <laughs> <laughs> friendly governments. Who wanted friendly governments? Stalin. 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 Stalin insisted that he have friendly governments to his western border. What was Truman demanding? Free elections. Free elections. Free elections. And this is what created a great deal of tension because, obviously, what could we do? Unless we go to war with the Soviet Union, where was the Soviet Union's Red Army at? In those territories. They were in all those areas. Yes, that's friendly government. Governments that are friendly to you. Oh, what? <laughs> if I'm the Soviet Union, what country had invaded me twice, or Russia, in the recent past? Germany. Germany. So do I want Germany or some other unfriendly government invade me in the future? No. So Stalin's insisting that he have friendly governments to his border. How is he going to guarantee that? He's going to maintain his Red Army occupying those territories and make sure the governments are led by leaders who are friendly to the Soviet Union. What government does the Soviet Union have? Communist. What kind of government do we want that are friendly to our east, our western border to, to the uh, east of us? Communist. Communists. And so we're going to see... Moscow-trained, loyal Soviet leaders being placed in those territories of Eastern Europe, to the west of the Soviet Union. We couldn't stop them in those territories, but we could contain them. And so what's the Truman Doctrine all about? Containment, containment policy. Where do we see the containment policy arise from? What, what area? Okay, it took place in Greece and Turkey when the governments there were being, in a sense, badgered by communists infiltrating and trying to influence the population and trying to overthrow the government. They appealed for aid and assistance. Truman went to the Congress and asked for funds and military support to help stop a minority group from pressuring these majority of the people into something they don't want. And that's where we get the containment policy in Europe. Help to preserve Greece and Turkey from turning to communism. Okay? What's the other economic plan that came from the United States that helped? Okay. Now, if we look at the United States at the conclusion of World War I, after the Treaty of Versailles was signed, you see the President Woodrow Wilson comes back home. What was the attitude of the United States to Europe? They turned their, turn their back. Basically, the idea was that we wanted to remain isolated from events in Europe like we had since the time period of Washington. And we tried to try to keep out of European affairs until we got involved in World War I. 
At the conclusion of World War One, Americans said, "Let's get back to isolationism. Let's start, let's stay out of events in Europe." And we did about the time in terms of when we went into war, World War II. However, at the conclusion of World War II, and even to this day, is the United States going to remain isolated? No. Out of European affairs, no. And so what we need to understand is that now with the, uh, with the uh, uh, Marshall Plan, we're seeing the United States provide aid, financial aid, economic aid, to help Europe recover. And that was one of the big issues that caused Obviously, the, the, the hardships of the Europeans following World War One is trying to rebuild. Factories destroyed. The economies are ruined. You know, morale is down. People are trying to recover, and all this despair, and it led them during these desperate times to turn to desperate government. And that's where we saw the rise of the totalitarian dictators in the between the war time period. Following World War II, we didn't want that to happen. And so once again, we began to pump in money to help those nations that desired it. Where is the prime example where Marshall Plan aid helped European nations recover? Or the prime example of it? West In Germany. West Germany. We saw a Western Renaissance take place, and Western Germany was a prime example because what had we done with Germany as part of our agreement? Separated it into four different sectors. Great Britain, the United States, and France, and the Soviet Union all had different zones of occupation following World War II to make sure that Germany would never be a threat again and to make sure that um, the recovery would take place in this area. Austria was also divided in that manner. Uh, so, economic recovery, Western Germany recovered economically and, and thrived, while in Eastern Germany under the Soviet control they did not. Okay? Questions? Okay. Um, you said that like the countries occupied Germany. When did they leave Germany, or do we uh, still? We still have uh, military bases in Germany. <laughs> Prime example: of the Cold War. Cold War division. What's the prime symbolism of the Cold War? Iron Curtain. Okay, the, the symbolic the Iron Curtain. Where is the clear division that takes place that we can see visually? West Germany, East Germany. The Berlin Wall. And because Berlin was located in the Soviet sector, and because Berlin was the capital city of Germany, Berlin was further divided into four different zones of occupation. The United States decided that they would combine their zones of occupation in Germany, and it was at that point when, when the Soviet Union thought, hey, if you guys aren't going to try to work towards unifying all of Germany, then you have no business coming into West Germany or West Berlin, because it said in East Germany their zone of occupation, which led to the Berlin blockade, which led to the Berlin airlift, which meant that there was a, a heated portion of the Cold War that almost led to a conflict. Eventually the Soviet Union lifted the blockade and war or further war was avoided. Okay. This is the uh, image of the uh, okay. Alright, when we think of European integration, one of the themes we look at after World War II is the Cold War, but we also look at how European unity begins to move together. Thank you. European integration is based on four different treaties that help formulate what we know today as the European Union. The Treaty of Paris established the European Coal and Steel Community, those six nations that signed this agreement are going to further unite their uh, unification in 1851 and again in 18, or, I'm sorry, 1951 and again in 1952 we're looking at the uh, treaties of Rome. Okay? A treaty that established the European Economic Energy or, or, or European Energy Community or Euratom is another example of this 
using atomic energy uh, in, in like a energy as opposed to as a weapon as part of this. Okay. Also, the treaty that established the European Economic Community, or EEC, uh, was signed along with the Euratom Treaty in Rome in 1957, and it entered into force on January 1st of 1958. The two treaties together, the Euratom Treaty and the Treaty uh, of Rome, are often referred to as the treaties, plural, of Rome. came into force in November 1st of 1993, changed its name to the European Economic Community, or simply the European Community. The treaty is going to set a goal of creating a common currency in the future. What is that common currency known as? Euro. Euro. currency, the euro, that makes trade easier. Before the euro, if you went from one country to another in Europe, you would have to exchange currencies. And every time you exchange currency, there's usually a fee involved. It makes it very difficult to trade. What was the uh, European customs union that we talked about that united all the different German states before they were actually unified politically? What was it called? Uh -huh. Dissolver. And that helped to kind of bring about greater cooperation amongst them because otherwise...